Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. And on today's episode, I am going to be joined by Mike Simpson, he is the VP of e-commerce at NFI, and NFI is a very large 3PL that we see all over the place here in New Jersey, where I'm at. I see their trucks all over the place, definitely as I'm uh, driving about and also uh, sometimes walking around in, in Philly too, uh, doing some loading, unloading. But we're going to talk specifically more about their e-commerce um, side of things today and focus on that. But before we get into that, first, let's, let's welcome Mike to the show mike how are you i'm doing great kevin thanks for for having me on good good it's happy to, happy to have you on as i said i see nfi all over the place i'm in my area so definitely very happy to be talking to you guys on the podcast finally but for i guess people that maybe are not familiar or maybe have, have seen nfi but not sure exactly what you guys do why don't you kind of give us a, a brief overview tell us about nfi as a, a whole and, and kind of what encompasses within nfi services Sure. Yeah. So NFI has been in business for 90 years. We just celebrated our 90th year last year and it was we're one of the largest 3PLs in the country. Top three for sure. Nice. We have about 70 million square feet of warehouse operations in both the U.S. and Canada. It's actually gone up quite a bit in the last couple of years and started out as a trucking company. One of the largest privately held 3PL companies in the U.S., Again, started 90 years ago by the Brown family. The Brown family still owns it today. They're on their third generation of leaders that are leading the company. And the fourth generation is currently working its way through the ranks um, within the leadership ranks of NFI. Oh, wow. So part of our growth strategy at NFI has been through organic growth, specifically mm -hmm. over the past 10 years. Uh, we've had quite a bit of organic growth, but then also strategic acquisitions that that helps the organization and the organization that we're acquiring add more services to the NFI portfolio. Mm. Very interesting. And obviously a long history there for, for 90 years. I mean, a lot of change has happened within the transportation, distribution, warehousing side of things. And, you know, a lot of different things and that technology has come into play as well. And we'll touch on some of those things today in our conversation. But obviously, you know, very impressive the the scale and, and size that you guys have been able to achieve, as you mentioned, being one of the top three, uh, three PLs in, in there in the conversation. So now recently, Recently, though, you know, more recent than 90 years, I guess you could say, right? Uh, <laughs> you guys yeah. have kind of dove into the e-commerce the e world under NFI Ecom. So tell us, uh, I guess, why? why? Why did NFI decide to put a, a larger focus on e-commerce operations and, and fulfillment? Sure. Yeah, NFI has multiple services. You mentioned the trucking. Mm -hmm. We have port services. We have global services. There's brokerage division. There's there's quite a few, and of course, distribution that operates as part of the 70 million square feet has powered in, powered out. There is other distribution services such as e-commerce that the larger NFI does throughout the throughout the U.S. and Canada. And of course, with the acquisition of SDR recently, that expands our footprint in Canada to also offer more e-commerce in Canada. But within the U.S., we ship over 25 million packages of e-commerce as part of the larger NFI organization. Mm. And the journey that I started on two years ago was to help the organization identify 
what is our strategy for growth within e-commerce? Mm. And where is what is the market need? So uh, along with several members of the executive team and sponsors and a small team of us worked on researching the e-commerce market okay. and identifying what is the largest area of need within the e-com market. So we knew e-commerce is, was going to continue to grow. We spent about six months researching the market, I had over 100 interviews that we did with with brands and, and retailers mm-hmm. and determined that the biggest area of need was in that the mid-market brand side. There's, we, saw a, we saw a significant amount of churn and thrash within that market talking to the, the brands in that, number one, their, their three PLs and their partners just could not live up to the promises that they made. Um, and number two, they just couldn't support the growth of those uh, of the brands as they go from you know incubator stage to to shipping 500 orders a day to 10,000 orders a day. They just could not support that growth within the organization. So our focus has been to provide a solution to the mid market retailer that we bring to bear what a large organization can bring. You know, I mentioned all the services we talked about before, but then bring that at an efficient speed to market perspective that the brands need in order to, to, to provide the scale for their growth. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting you pointing out that you saw this kind of churn and, and thrash there within, within the market. I'm, I'm curious, what do you think was kind of the, the cause or the, the driver of that at that level, the, that mid market level that you mentioned? Yeah. At the time we were doing this, it was, the mid to the end of the pandemic. I yeah. guess it is officially ended, right? <laughs> uh, I think so. Yeah. For, the, for the U.S. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so we, we felt that there, the, the unprecedented volume that came through e-commerce for, mm-hmm. uh, for both need and you know, market, uh, what the market was driving uh, caused some of that. Uh, I think the, the ability to scale and be flexible for the brands was not, was not a trait that some of the existing providers had. Some of them did it very well and were able to support mm-hmm. the brands, but uh, a vast majority of them were not. Uh, they could not scale. The warehouse square footage at the time was not, uh, or was at a premium, could mm-hmm. not get it. Right. So the expansion of, of those with a smaller footprint, they couldn't, uh, quote unquote, squeeze more volume into the existing square foot that they had. Mm-hmm. And, and I think part of it was also from a customer service perspective, the the 3PLs just weren't used to the level of support that was needed as brands mm-hmm. grow. And, you know, maybe brands at that time weren't able to communicate what they were were needing at that time because they weren't expecting that tremendous amount of growth either. So I think all of that put together caused the the perfect split perfect storm, if yeah. you will, to to you know make this this particular market uh, in need of someone that has a you know tenured experience in handling customers, mm-hmm. uh, but then also have the flexibility within warehouse in their warehouse space to to make sure they could expand. Mm. Interesting, yeah, yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense because there certainly was a a lot of volatility, I guess you could say, around that that pandemic and a lot of unexpected things um, happening. Especially one of them being just a substantial spike in, in e-commerce volume overall, which I think probably made a lot of companies too, and uh, e-commerce mm-hmm. companies and, and DTC brands that were, you know, just getting a, a start or, or coming up with an idea, and all of a sudden, you know, people are are buying online like crazy. Really interesting stuff that that happened there. But as you mentioned. Now, you know, we are, uh, I guess, you know, at the end of the pandemic, pandemic is, is over, uh, whatever you want to say there. So, you know, things are, are maybe level setting or, or changing, but, you know, how does, I guess right now in, in current times, we can say, how does NFI view the current state of e-commerce? Yeah, e-commerce is strong. I mean, we're seeing it with our, our customers. It's not as strong as it was and the volume wasn't as high as it was during the crazy forced need to, to go to um, online purchasing, uh, but it's still strong. It's following the trajectory that it was on prior to the pandemic. Uh, you know, we were on a, a, a growth rate that was, if you take that straight line growth rate and take out the, the spike that you saw from COVID, uh, we're doing 
nationally and globally, we're, we're back to that trajectory. We were mm. down, the volume is down from what it was expected to be, uh, you know, if retailers didn't take that into account or brands didn't take that into account over the past year or so as they're forecasting, then, you know, we're seeing that for sure, the volume decrease, but we're, we're on a very strong trajectory. I think the, from an NFI perspective, mm. being able to support customers through the pandemic has been very good for NFI and for NFI e-commerce. The reputation is strong in the market for you know, doing what we say we can do and, right. and executing. And, and I think the, the now that the retail doors are open, the mm. e-commerce kind of is coming back to, to normal. Although it's still from a growth perspective, I saw a report the other day that it was about 24 or in the U.S. anyway, I'll start with the U.S., sure. seen as high as about 24 percent of retail sales on har- on physical goods in the U.S. are e-commerce. And that's expected to grow to about 33 percent mm. by 2027. So it's it's a still a strong, you know, it's a strong market. Yeah. And from if you, you look at the big boys are always going to get their volume. Right. Yeah. It's now yeah. that mid market that is really clawing for volume. And, and there's a lot of great products uh, out in the market. And, you know, consumers are, are attracted to that. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think this, you know, this mid market brand retailer uh, market is really they're deserving of a type of product from a fulfillment partner perspective. Um, I'm sure you're seeing this as well with your your new warehouse uh, and yeah. filling that up with new customers. They are deserving of of whatever we can provide to them from a service perspective and, and from an expedience at, a, at an effective cost. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's really interesting to, to see that. And like you said, the the potential growth that's there for e-commerce, I think is is a lot, right? There's there's a lot that can happen there in, in the market, especially as, you know, consumer behavior is certainly, I think for a lot of people, changed a little bit since the pandemic because it was kind of the only option to go e-commerce for, for a little while. And I think that stuck with a lot of people who maybe in the past were traditionally brick and mortar shoppers only, you know, I, I know certainly some of the, the older generations do like, you know, some of the people in my family are not familiar with, you know, ordering online previously at a, a larger volume or anything like that. And now, you know, they're kind of avid online shoppers. So, so it's interesting how that mm-hmm. shift has happened. And I think that's pushing a lot of growth there towards e-commerce as well. But I'm um, I'm curious there on that kind of retail versus, you know, I guess like physical retail versus e-commerce front. I mean, NFI as a whole plays in in both arenas, right? So I'm curious as we see where, you know, companies are fulfilling orders from the store and doing different types of whether it's pickup in store, curbside pickup, different types of fulfillment channels are have you guys seen a, a difference in what you do for fulfillment versus shipping direct to the stores for like their replenishments? I mean, has that kind of changed a little bit as well? It has organizationally. And I guess from a the whole broad market perspective, mm-hmm. we're following the same trends. The, the big retailers, you know, the, the retailers that we support, at NFI are still growing, like they're a growing organization. So they're the e-commerce growth that they see isn't as impactful to, because that that still has to come to the distribution center that we operate. Mm-hmm. It has, still has to go through the cross stock that we have. So we have a nice cross section of services that we're able to support large organizations. And so the volume that that comes through us is still is still strong. Mm-hmm. We do see as the, the rate of e-commerce, whether we operate that for the for the customers or not, the rate of e-commerce is growing faster than the retail sales. Mm. So that's where we do see the impact. We're not, sometimes we are, but sometimes we are not providing the end customer shipping for the retailers, whereas we would fill their warehouse that comes through either our distribution center or cross stock or port services. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I was wondering if that's kind of, Shifted a little bit too, so it's an interesting insight there as you guys are kind of playing on both sides of the 
the field in a, in a sense, I guess, and then touching all those different aspects of the fulfillment channels. So now obviously with, with increased volume and increase of e-commerce throughput, a lot of times, you know, and to be able to, to handle that and increase your capacity, you have to look to automation and robotics to try and handle that and also prepare for, for future growth as well. So I'm curious, you know, how is how does NFI approach the automation and, and robotics and, and have you guys implemented automation robotics yet? Yeah, what does that look like for NFI? Yeah, that's a great question, Kevin. And it's one that we've spent an enormous amount of time mm-hmm. studying and, and and we'll continue to do that because, you know, we keep mentioning the, or I keep mentioning the past couple of years where it's been an onslaught of, of volume. There's also now an onslaught of, of innovation that's happened. There's a tremendous amount of innovation mm-hmm. that's happened over the past couple of years. And, and a lot of it is focused on decreasing time to pick, right. Or yeah. unload a trailer. It depends on where you're, where you are. And, and from a, an NFI perspective, part of what we're investing in is innovation that, that helps supplement the labor pool. Uh, we're, we're not trying to eliminate that. We're trying to make the working conditions better. We're trying to supplement, you know, the uh, unemployment rate is mm-hmm. down to you know less than four percent. Nationally, it's yeah. around four percent, and in some of the key markets where we have warehousing, it's you know three and a half percent, three percent. So yeah. we're trying to supplement to make sure that we can meet those customer needs. We have you know at the ports, we have uh, a test going on with Boston Dynamics, where we're we're at the the leading edge there with Boston Dynamics on uh, a robot that can help unload trailers. Okay. So we're working through that. And then specifically we have an, I would say the best engineering group in the world. I'll, I'll put that out there. Best engineering, <laughs> with our uh, integrated design and solutions group that has a portion that is focused on seeking out innovation mm-hmm. and within our organization. So specifically within a file, we use, you know, it's either goods to person or a, a person following a robot, right? There's the Six Rivers, there's Locust, there's Auto Store. We have several large auto stores that, that we operate. So from an e-com perspective, we we look at what is ultimately what is the customer need mm-hmm. and, and how can we provide that? So automation has its place. There's a, I think of it as an automation cycle, yeah. right? There's a, you know, follow the robots may be one um at one end of the spectrum or doing it manually with no automation. And then at the very far end, it's good goods to person where you have an individual standing there that scans, right? Just and puts it in a box. And, mm. and then I guess there's even further where dark warehouses where it's all done automatically. There's varying levels of capital spend with each one of those. And I think it has yeah. to fit. And what we've done within NFI is find where it fits best to both uh, from a customer perspective and find what automation is needed for the customer. Mm-hmm. And then for NFI operationally, how can we run it as, as uh, efficiently as possible? And then, which is for both of those, the customer and within NFI, what is the cost to do that? And how do we, how do we uh, make sure it's the right cost to serve for what the customer is looking for? Mm. Very interesting. And, and I think it's great that you guys are, are kind of, always kind of uh, looking at that and, and seeing, you know, where is the best case for you to try and address with with automation or robotics. And obviously, like you said, you have, you have uh, multiple iterations and different types of automation in place already and, and robotics as well. So very good. And, and obviously, you know, like you mentioned, I, I mean, I think it is really um, interesting to, to point out there that, you know, you're saying the, the national average unemployment is like 4%, uh, under 4%, but in uh, highly concentrated um, distribution warehouse areas, um, it, it can be even lower. I think it's it's a little uh, wild. I'm, I'm here in New Jersey, in uh, Central Jersey, which is you know very densely populated from a warehouse perspective. Um, and I'm sure NFI is, operates in in multiple areas of the country where. It's the same scenario. So uh, I'm curious on that front. Uh, aside from you know implementing automation and robotics to try and help offset some of that difficulty in, in getting labor. 
Um, how else ha- has NFI, you know, kind of tried to attract new labor, um, but also made sure that they can retain existing labor as well, especially as we've gone through such kind of a volatile labor market here in the past couple of years? We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, it's a great question and and one that, that we spend a lot of time as leadership focusing on is employee retention. You know, there's a, there's a attract, retain, and develop is kind of the, the mantra we use here at NFI to make sure our labor pool uh, continues to, uh, to grow mm-hmm. as we grow and support the growth of the organization. And it starts with culture, culture yeah. from the top down. And I mentioned the, the family owned at the beginning of the podcast that, that this is a family owned business mm-hmm. and, and it is run that way. As you know, you think of your your family or others' families, and and there's not always you know rainbows and unicorns, right? There's a <laughs> there's yeah. there's challenging that's done, and and that's rightfully so, for the betterment of the organization, the betterment of the environment, and the culture within NFI. So we're we're very strong believers in setting the right culture, and we hire leaders that do that, and that's not for everybody, right? We're we're but it is a a very culturally driven from the top down from an expectation perspective. And a big part of that, Kevin, is safety. You, know, you, yeah. you, you see in, in your warehouses that your warehouse that if you're not safe, then people don't want to work in unsafe environments. Right. And so, you know, we, we invest a lot of time in that. There's a, a structure within NFI that supports that, but then it's also down to the facility leader, the directors and vice presidents and SVPs, and, you know, every leadership structure or every, every rung in the ladder. It's very important from a safety perspective. We launched in Columbus, a customer and recently, and from day one, you know, we installed the behavioral based safety program. And that's not uncommon throughout the organization that, you know, day one, you start with safety, the very first thing you talk to your employees about, and then you, you, you piece in leaders that have that same focus and if they don't then they're just not meant to be with nfi and that's okay right so you know from culture and then safety and, and i would say hiring the right talent that is uh, around that you know that that is also focused on that from a natural development and as a as an individual and as a leader i think we nfi has done a very good job of surrounding leaders with other leaders that all have that very similar mindset. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great thing. And, and it's great that you're, you're striving and, and having such an emphasis to on, on having a, a safe work environment, which I think goes a very long way for employees and, and the benefits overall of that are, are humongous and, and can go very, very long term for, for people to feel comfortable and f- feel safe within the place that they, they work and know that they're going to come and, you know, have a, a comfortable day and not necessarily be need to be worried that something may happen and, and they're going to leave the the same way that they came in the door. Right. I think, which is exactly right. extremely important. So it's great that you guys are, are emphasizing that. And, and I'm glad that we could, we could bring that up and, and touch on that. So as we look at e-commerce fulfillment, and I know you mentioned here, I think before we started recording and just saying hello that, you know, it's uh, time to prepare for, for peak season already and, and Q4 in the e-commerce world. And I mean, all the worlds really that we deal with within where, 
warehousing and, and getting ready for that push and, and extra capacity that's needed and, and throughput. So uh, as you look at e-commerce now, we're recording this in the beginning of, of August here, but as you look towards peak season and then beyond into you know Q1, Q2 of 2024, how does NFI view e-commerce fulfillment kind of heading through that peak and then heading out of the peak and into the next year? Yeah, this this peak is going to be very telling. Um, I think is just <laughs> yeah. what the uh, what the continued steady growth will be for the industry. We do see continued steady growth um, for for e commerce, as we mentioned earlier, on the percentage of growth. It will continue to take more market share from retail stores, mm. but also retail stores, as you mentioned, Kevin, very rightly so, is that. Some of the fulfillment is being done out of retail stores to to really take advantage of the, the brick and mortar that the, the retail stores have. So, you know, I, I do see it's going to continue to grow. I think it's going to be a steady growth. It won't be a, a, a pandemic type growth that we've seen. Mm-hmm. Q4 is always, you know, 200 to 300 percent increase on peak day from normal volume. We do see that continuing, but it'll be it'll be telling to see what this growth is and where percentage of the overall retail market share is taking. Does it, do the, um, the big retailers lose uh, or not grow as fast? You know, maybe they grow 8% instead of 10% and the, the mid market and the smaller retailers, do they grow 40% instead of, you know, the 15%. So it'll be telling. I think the mid market brands are, are poised to, to, so they've got the marketing piece down. They've got mm-hmm. the, the, those, the marketing and the advertising. Um, they've got that piece figured out, and they are where consumers are. So it'll be it'll be very interesting. Uh, what, what I'm very curious, and I'd like your opinion on this too, Kevin, is sure. the 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 what is the speed to delivery that that you're seeing in the market mm-hmm. on. You know, does it need to be next day, same day? The micro fulfillments that that popped up over the last, you know, few years, and then now some products may not need that, so five days is okay. What are what are you seeing in the market? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting because you know there was so much emphasis and push, and so many startups that came out around the, you know, quick delivery and you know, same day, two hour. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, right? Super quick stuff. But a lot of those have kind of faded out in a sense, because I think, you know, and I've kind of pulled this before on LinkedIn too, a little bit, just asking like, you know, what, what type of things like, would you really want to order and have delivered to you, you know, within an hour or two hours or even same day? And, And I think the reality is that like, you know, most of the products that are out there. Like, I think there's only like a very specific set of products that we would want to get delivered same day, which, you know, I think obviously grocery is, is one of them, but you know, and, and it's also like very specific Mm. use cases too. It's like, you know, I think uh, I talked to one of my connections and, you know, they're like, oh, I was, I was traveling and I realized that I forgot my toothbrush or something like that. And I was able to get it, you know, within just a a couple hours of landing through a GoPuff or something like that. And, you know, I think those types of things is kind of like one-off situations. And, uh, you know, I think it's getting more towards, and, and what I'm hearing in the market as well, is that customers really just want to understand like when something is delivering versus like the, the speed. I think there is some, some factor in the speed. I mean, I think, you know, if you're looking at something and this is like me personally speaking to as a consumer, like, you know, if I'm seeing something that comes up and it tells me, you know, it's not going to deliver for more than five days, like I'm kind of like, you know, what's, what's going on over there a little bit, especially as someone that works in the industry. Right. But, you know, I think like if there's clear visibility into when it's going to arrive and deliver, I think that's becoming more important than necessarily the speed because i think a lot of times as you're ordering products we're kind of planning ordering a lot of pro- uh, pro- of the products like around things that we're going to do in life right so sure yeah. it's like oh, okay i'm gonna order a shirt for 
I have an event that I need to go to. So I'm going to order like a, a new shirt, a new shirt, or, you know, maybe it's a, a dress for a, a female that's going to, you know, a wedding or, or something like that. And it's like, oh, okay, I just got invited to this thing and I know that I need it by Thursday. It's Sunday. If I look at my shipping options, like, can I get it by Thursday? And then, you know, it says like, oh, it's going to be there by Thursday. And then, you know, it turns out it doesn't show up until Friday. Well, then, you know, and you had like no visibility in the tracking process of that. I think that's like where consumers are really having like a, a pain point is, is understanding when is that really showing up. So, you know, I think that's becoming more important, but certainly I think there's a, a push more towards like next day, two day versus the reality of like, you know, same day, faster del- types of delivery. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you nailed it from both the customer being able to be a little more planned than yeah. maybe we were from a, you know, over the past two years mm. and planning for those purchases. And then, you know, being able to understand when it's going to be delivered, uh, both great points. And I think that's what we're hearing from the brands is that that's what they're hearing from their customers as well is the just tell me when it's going to get here so I yeah. can make a buying decision. And if it's more than five days, it's probably not, you know, in some cases it may be okay, but you know, in, in most cases it, it needs to be five or below. Yeah, I think exactly. Cause it's kind of like, you know, I know I think about like, me personally, and I'm like, I, I think of something I needed. It's, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night, so I'm not going to go to the store. I'm going to look online and see if I can get it. And then online, it says it's going to be there. I can, you know, five days or something. And I'm like, you know, what? like I'll go to the store in the morning mm-hmm. like, if I really need it. So I think it is just that understanding, like you said, of, you know, can the consumer make a decision and, and plan based on that, that purchase, like, and where is the right point to do that from so i think the more visibility we get into that the better because i'll say even like with amazon it's like i see there in my area at least they have more and more things that can deliver like overnight and they're going to be there you know i ordered some stuff the other night actually and it was like 10 30 at night and I guess I do all my shopping at night as, as I'm saying these two <laughs> examples, right? But, uh, it was like 10 30 at night and it was like, Oh, it can deliver between 7 AM and 11 AM, which, you know, essentially in reality, the same day, it's less than 24 hours. Right. But, uh, they're calling it overnight and, and, you know, I see that and it's like, it's like, Oh, it's, a, it's a nice to have, but you know, if I had to pay for that option, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't pay for it. I would just wait for it to come the next day or, or whatever the case may be. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's around that visibility and how do we define that? And I'm sure, you know, things will change as, as some people push towards, towards other things and things like that. But it'd be interesting to see how that evolves and in different markets too. And I guess, mm-hmm. you know, speaking of different markets as well, you guys um, are also looking, we talked a lot about the kind of the U S market here, but you guys also have gotten into the, the Canadian market as well. We've acquired a company called right. SDR. So tell us a little bit about that and how that kind of expands the portfolio for NFI. But I'm curious too, like on some of the potential differences there between Canadian market versus U S market on the fulfillment side. Sure. Yeah. It was earlier this year. Uh, a few months ago is when uh, NFI acquired SDR, and and that effectively doubled our footprint within within Canada uh, from uh, both a people perspective and a square foot uh, oh, wow. perspective. So it's we have about four million square feet with mm-hmm. the with the combined company now in in Canada. Very similar cultures to you know between the two between NFI and SDR. Mm-hmm. Great operators, great business. People that they really did a did a great job growing that um, business very smartly, and we're happy to have them as part of the NFI family. From an e-commerce perspective, they they do quite a bit of e-commerce in Canada, uh, and where we see a lot of synergies is for the U.S. team to be able to help the the Canadian team, the SDR team, on how to provide support to those customers as they you know would want to go into the U.S. Uh, previously, uh, those customers would have to just work with somebody else uh, outside of STR because they didn't really have a large, uh, I think there was one one warehouse within the U.S. So they didn't have a, a large presence. And now 
as I mentioned before, that we they have now 70 million square feet to, to be able to support those customers within the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and it goes both ways, right? We have now 4 million square feet uh, to and you know, numerous customers on the SDR side that yeah. help support the growth. And of course, the, the tremendous team that uh, was built by SDR up there. So, you know, we, we do see that that acquisition as a great win for, for both teams. And now as a collective team, we, we're, we're working, you know, already starting to work together on how we can provide a better customer service and better support to the customers that we have uh, on both sides of the border. Mm. Interesting, interesting. And it sounds like a really kind of mutually beneficial relationship there and, and you know, makes sense to to expand the footprint and in, in, on both sides of the table. So I'm curious in that, that regard, you know, we talk a little bit about, I mean, we're kind of talking about consumer demand on delivery expectations and, you know, primarily kind of, I think, talking about the U.S. market there, but I, I mean, do you see differences in you know fulfillment expectations from the Canadian culture versus the American culture? I know you know typically, I think Americans we get labeled as you know wanting things right away and you know wanting <laughs> that satisfaction right away. So I'm curious, is there is there a, a difference in fulfillment expectations from a, a Canadian perspective versus a, an American perspective? And certainly not as as read into the Canadian market as our friends north of the border. But mm -hmm. from what what I've seen and understand is that they are um, a little more patient than the U.S. As okay. you mentioned, uh, <laughs> they still have a demanding customer base, but yeah. you know they're more apt to go to the store that they've been going to for you know than you know the very high adoption rate on the use of the internet, mm -hmm. a little slower in adopting the e-commerce fulfillment, maybe since the pandemic, that's, that's changed some, some minds, as you pointed out before with, with the, with those, uh, you know, now they got a taste of what e-commerce can do for them. Yeah. And, you know, the expectations are certainly rising, but yeah, it's as with any country, it's a, a demanding customer base as they're, they're spending their hard earned money. Mm -hmm. just like everybody else. So they want, they expect uh, what they're told is what they'll get delivered. Mm. All right. Interesting. Yeah, I was curious about that. See if there's any kind of differences there. So very interesting stuff with you here, Mike, and, and really enjoyed learning about NFI and NFI Ecom as well. Um, I look forward to hearing more about this and, and kind of your, your perspectives and the NFI perspectives from the fulfillment, distribution, 3PL world as well. If people are interested in learning more about NFI or NFI Ecom specifically, what's the best way to do that? So to learn about NFI Ecom specifically, go to NFI Ecom with one M.com. That'll direct you to our site and, and give you the insight to what we do and, and how we do it and why we do it. There's also a contact form page there if you're you're interested in learning more or connect with, with me on LinkedIn. It's Michael Simpson and um, I'm on LinkedIn quite often. All right. Great. And for the, for the larger organization, uh, nfiindustries.com, that'll share, that'll show all of the service, tremendous amount of services that we do from the global importing to port services to transportation, brokerage, and distribution. All right, great. And we'll definitely put all that information at the newwarehouse.com as well so people can easily find it. So Mike, thank you for all your insights and time today on the show. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from the new warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for the new warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.